Bienvenido, bienvenido. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ana Carvalho as our first plenary speaker at OSU Chile in 2012. Um, I'm very happy to have Ana as my colleague and friend, and um, I was interested to hear what she's talking about. Just a little bit of her background, for those of you who don't know, she's an associate professor at the University of Arizona, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. She did her master's degree uh, at the University of Georgia, where suddenly becoming an OSU branch campus, <laughs> so you know. Um, she got her PhD from UC Berkeley, which I won't hold against her, that's Stanford grad, um, in 1998. Um, she's edited several books, including Portuguese in Contacto and Portuguese para Falantes do Espanol. Um, I think we all probably know about her wonderful sociolinguistic uh, language contact work in, uh, on the border of Brazil and uh, Uruguay, and specifically in Rivera. Uh, I think her paper um, from 2004, I Speak Like the Guys on TV, that was in Language Duration and Change, is a classic that I've had many a poor student, including some in the room, um, read it and really get down to the nitty gritty with it. Um, she also has some great papers on Spanish S aspiration, second person forms in Uruguayan border Spanish, um, and also wrote the chapter on Portuguese in the United States for a book called Language Diversity in the United States. So she's done a lot to promote um, sociolinguistics of Portuguese, um, contact between Spanish and Portuguese, um, uh, not only in this country, but also beyond, and done very groundbreaking work um, in the border area of Brazil and Uruguay. Um, and today, I lost her title, but it was there. Today, after, today she is going to talk to us on the topic of sociolinguistic continuities and language context situations, the case of Portuguese in contact with Spanish along the Uruguayan-Brazilian border. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ana Carvalho. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, very much. I think you're biased. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. I've wanted to visit this campus for a long time. I've wanted to come and visit Scott and his wonderful students for a long time, so it's a great honor to come as a guest. Uh, thank Mary Bitton, Chrissy Garcia, and Hannah Washington, uh, oh no, Hannah, yeah, Washington, for the invitation, and Ashley Love for arranging travels. Today I will talk about the research that I have been carrying out, as Scott said, on the contact between Portuguese and Spanish in North Uruguay. I will present sociolinguistic patterns that I have um, detected along the years of my research, which represent, I will argue, sociolinguistic continuities with national varieties of Spanish and Portuguese. By doing so, I will argue against the idea that a new language is formed in these communities, a Portuguese-Spanish hybrid used as a single code that would represent a rupture from the surrounding national varieties, a view that is quite prevalent um, among analysis of this context zone. By revealing Spanish and Portuguese bilingual and multidialectal repertoires in these communities as an alternative proposal to the idea of a single mixed code, I will also shed light on the contributions of the variationist framework of analysis to the study of contact, of this language contact in particular and of language contact in general. So let's look at a map. Um, this is a map of northern Uruguay where one can find several communities where Spanish is spoken as the first language of a large part of the population. Uh, border towns such as Artigas, Rivera, and Acegua, but also the uh, south uh, in isolated towns along the border. Uh, the reasons for the presence of Portuguese in Uruguay are found in the region's colonial history. Brazilian and Portuguese settlers colonized the area until the end of the 19th century, 
when only Portuguese was spoken north of Rio Negro, and you see that Rio Negro pretty much cuts the country in half. Uh, from that point on, from the end of 19th century on, several measures were taken to introduce the Hispanic element to the border as part of the Uruguayan government's effort to unify the country and counteract the presence of Portuguese. By early 20th century, Spanish had in fact penetrated the Portuguese-speaking north, but despite Spanish-only language policies throughout the 20th century, Portuguese has survived and bilingualism is widespread and to a certain extent diglossic. Spanish is the language of school and public life, whereas Portuguese is employed as the vernacular in in-group interactions. The presence of Portuguese in Uruguay was first detected by Pedro Rona, a linguist who was traveling and collecting data in the 50s in Uruguay and was caught by surprise when he found that people were speaking something that did not sound like Spanish, but Portuguese. Since then, several studies have been completed on these border communities. Um, so in Artigas, I did some work in Artigas, but uh, Kendra Douglas has um, um, done uh, large-scale ethnographics, um, ethnographic work there. Um, Rivera is by far the most um, studied community. Um, I have done most of my studies there, so have uh, Adolfo Elisaicin and his collaborators. Uh, Fred Hensi wrote a book in 1972 about the sociolinguistic situation there. Uh, more recently, Watermeyer uh, wrote on border Spanish, and um, Meirelles wrote on the phonology of border Portuguese from both sides of the border. And Lipsky has also started to investigate Uruguay and Portuguese as part of his uh, large project of documenting the contact between Spanish and Portuguese along the border of Brazil. Um, Asegua um, is now being studied by Pacheco, a PhD student at the University of Brasilia. And um, Chui, which is further south, um, has been studied by Tatiana Maral, who has great work on Spanish and Portuguese code switching, and Ildo Couto. Um, my own studies are primarily based on um, data collected in Rivera. First, uh, a six months of ethnographic observation and sociolinguistic interviews with 88 bilinguals who were born and raised in Rivera. Um, interviews were first conducted in Spanish, and two weeks later I would come back and uh, and uh, interview them in Portuguese. I went back in 2002 to interview school children, parents, teachers, and administrators about the implementation of bilingual education in the area of Rivera and Artigas, and I used those interviews also as a source of uh, linguistic analysis. And uh, in 2006, I went back to, to video record spontaneous conversations, <coughs> I'm sorry, among family members in different households, and that gave me a great deal of, core, of uh, code switching data, which I did not have uh, in my interviews. Um, so this is the border. Um, this is um, Plaza de la Paz. This is Brazil. This is Uruguay. This is Santana do Livramento. This is Rivera. Um, Santana do Livramento, um, you only find Portuguese being spoken there, and of course people understand Spanish, but Portuguese, uh, Spanish is not there as a language, it's a productive language. And on the other side, Rivera is pretty bilingual, people speak both for the historical reasons that I just uh, summarized. Um, this is a picture of Rivera downtown where uh, most people speak Spanish, except for bus stops and markets where you can also hear Portuguese, and of course, uh, for the Brazilian tourists and visitors and, and shoppers. Um, Rivera Chico is a typical um, neighborhood that surrounds downtown. That's where the lower, work, lower middle class lives. And you can hear both Spanish and Portuguese. And then finally, this is a picture of Manduvi, one of the neighborhoods in the peripheries of Rivera, where the working class lives and where one hears Portuguese all the time. And where one finds um, the border culture very alive and little influenced by the national trends. Um, 
this type of geographic specification that I just showed you about neighborhoods um, of language preferences was confirmed by a quantification I did based on self-report language use extracted from interviews with 78 speakers. And uh, as you can see here, um, uh, Portuguese is mostly uh, preferred around the working class members, while the middle class show a strong preference for Spanish, and the lower middle class is somewhere in between. In addition to social groups, language choice is also conditioned, of course, by the context of interaction and by the interlocutor. As illustrated by one of my participants, a 62 years old woman from the working class, uh, her first language language is Portuguese. Her, she learned um, Spanish a little bit later in life when she went to school. Uh, and she was telling me how uh, she uses Portuguese all the time, except um, for when she goes to the doctor, for example. So she tells me, Ahora, si voy a una oficina, cualquier cosa, hablar con una persona de estudio en castellano, con el doctor, que me duele acá, me duele así, así. Pero de ahí a poco ya empiezo el portugués, pero a veces me sale. ¿Fase o qué? Not this code switch. Uh, she, then continues, she then continues to explain her self-correction strategies, emphasizing the need to use Spanish in some contexts, thanks to the diagnostic distribution of codes. Por ejemplo, eu vou, entonces yo ratifico, yo voy. Para la persona que estoy hablando, eu vou, recuerdo que no es así, que hay que decir entonces, yo repito, yo voy. Y es así que hago siempre. Sí, porque no soy brasileña, pero hablo portugués porque me crearon sí, no es. And then sí is, is pretty categorical. Yeah. Um, so, here we see that the separation of the languages is not only cognitively possible, but also socially very important. However, this claim counters assumptions made in previous studies about the lack of ability among these speakers to separate languages. Um, Lipsky, in his recent work, um, based on observations about Uruguayan Portuguese, adapts a monolectal view and sees Uruguayan Portuguese not as a dialect of Portuguese with Spanish contact features, um, but as a single code of mixed origins where one finds, and I quote, through hybridization rather than simple bilingualism with code switching and boring. He claims that Uruguayan Portuguese exemplifies the result of a radical code mixing that, due to typological similarities between Spanish and Portuguese, create stable and natively spoken new language. And he goes on to characterize Uruguayan Portuguese speakers' competence as fluent disfluency. The idea that Uruguayan Portuguese is in the middle of a continuum between Portuguese and Spanish is shared to a certain extent by Elisaicin and his associates, who propose that Uruguayan Portuguese speakers are monostylistic and lack a standard model. Kendra Douglas, on the other hand, sees that Uruguayan Portuguese is influenced by the presence of standard <laughs> Portuguese and standard Spanish, but from a Creolist viewpoint, proposes that um, the, presence of this stand, uh, the presence of standard Spanish and Portuguese varieties serve as acrolecto models for best lecto speakers of Uruguayan Portuguese and sees with Lipsky border speakers as disfluent speakers of a mesolecto variety. So let's keep these proposals in mind and here a sample taken from one of my interviews. The speaker is a 17 years old uh, woman who um, at that time lived in a working class neighborhood in Rivera. Her first language was Portuguese. Um, she was finishing high school at the time of the interview. Uh, she was the only uh, child of a single mother who was a maid. She's telling me about carnival in Rivera. Carnaval, eu saio com minha mãe, com minha tia e vou, vou ao carnaval aí, porque era a escola de samba de lá, desfilo aí, o primeiro dia desfilo na escola de samba na Sarandi, o dono daqui para lá, eu vim de lá para cá. 
aqui. É, são não sei quantas escalas de samba, é, três, passo um, a primeira noite faço um, a do, prim, do segundo grupo, que, são, que não são muito assim, é, bonitas, mas eu passo, sem menos integrar. E passo umas murgas daqui, os conjuntos, passo uma sala de desfilar do cantar. E a segunda noite passo umas de mais luxo, que tem muito mais, são preciosas as escolas de samba do, segundo, do primeiro grupo que eu Bueno, y después, él es ahí, y yo estoy ahí después, fin de semana, si yo a ver es ahí, después fin de semana, el desfila del primer grupo, no, desfilo un, un poco del primer grupo como del segundo grupo, y ya, después el resto, desfilo mezclado, así, y después desfilo todo de nuevo, desfilo un último día, que aún cae un sábado, puede ser, y desfilo toda la escala de San Bay, hasta el primer y segundo grupo. Pero este año voy a empezar el primer grupo porque dicen que las escuelas de samba es otra, las del segundo grupo, que esta vez cuando desfilaron estaba una noche linda, como fui. pero como había muchos turistas y los turistas no gustaron y comenzaron a hacer ahí. Entonces no vi una de segunda del primer grupo y entonces uno va a ver, tiene que tener más de 150 integrantes para poder desfilar un lujo cosa. Eu sempre quis ir em uma escola de samba, mas não, este ano nos combinei de tudo com a minha tia, mas eu não sei, acho que eu não vou ir, porque parece que tem que trabalhar, eles saem tarde do trabalho, da amiga dela e tudo, mas ele vai entrar, mas eu não, acho que não. Ok, eu não vou traduzir tudo isso. Um, but let's look at one uh, important feature of uh, Uruguayan Portuguese, which is the Spanish influence. Um, so you see here, Boyal, Las Escolas de Samba, Primeiro, and there is variation between Primeira and Primeiro, ou Sea, which is a pretty cool mixed first marker, uh, Murga, which is a boring, there is no equivalent in Portuguese, uh, Bueno, as a good cross marker, again, Pero, 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 this cross marker is in Spanish everywhere. Um, mezclado, and I'm not sure maybe here she's you know, correcting because she says Desfile Mezclado Seis, like not me, but people say that here. Um, etc. Passa instead of acontecing. And then we see some uh, features that are non standard but are very common in, <laughs> in, in Brazilian Portuguese as well. Uh, lack of agreement, as a scholar, las escola, as a scholar, de menos integrante. So lack of uh, plural agreement everywhere. Uh, Combinemos. This morpheme is very prevalent instead of amo, amos. Um, trabalho, é trabalhar, trabalho, so you see there's a variable here. So, so far, all these features are shared by, by Brazil and Portuguese as well, except for the post. The post is a local creation. It's used all the time, the post. So, um, it's, um, um, that's the only local creation that maybe would justify calling this a new language. Uh, the idea that a new language is formed, a portugal, is shared by others, for example, Sturgeon 2004, especially in the fields of anthropology and cultural studies, that tend to make direct connections between a hybrid identity with a hybrid language. You may be familiar with the debate around the word Spanglish in the U.S., while some linguists like Ricardo Tegui opposes the term based on the fact that it would uh, represent unfairly the linguistic repertoire of Latino bilinguals, Anacelia Sintea argues that Spanglish is an important identity marker and thus the term should be embraced by linguists as well. While I don't want to downplay the importance of, a lo of local fused lags as important identity markers for bilinguals, I do argue against a monolactal view that limits the speakers of border varieties to monolingual speakers of a hybrid, a view that disregards a much more complex, complex linguistic repertoire. And a complex linguistic repertoire can be reviewed by variation analysis based on systematic observation of data collection that is able to detect patterns of language use and point to sociolinguistic patterns that represent continuities. Pollack stresses the contribution of variation sociolinguistics to language context situations. Um, she says, um, variation theory involves the combination of techniques from linguistics, sociology, anthropology, and statistics, among others, 
to scientifically investigate language use and structure as manifested in naturalistic context. In scientifically <coughs> accounting for the production data contained in a speech sample, variationists seek to discover patterns of user, usage which pertain to the relative frequency of occurrence or co-occurrence of structures rather than simply to their existence or grammaticality. Parts of the segment that we just heard from, from Alicia, the woman, taken out of context, could be analyzed as mixed and disfluent. But Polak and Levy, recently in 2010, uh, warned us against the fact that inherent variability may be mistaken for change, and added that change is often evoked when the variant is stigmatized, and especially when used among groups considered vulnerable to external influences, like bilinguals. When looking at contact phenomena and non-standard features in bilingual dialects, we should ask, is the variant idiosyncratic? or is it part of the community grammar? With these questions in mind, my previous work, in addition to others, Watermeyer, 2006-2008, uh, um, Pacheco, forthcoming, etc., have been able to detect patterns of use and detect opposite tendencies in Uruguay and Portuguese. On one hand, both Uruguay and Portuguese and border Spanish can diverge from national dialects due to the presence of content features and local variants. These dialects define local, focused border varieties that are deeply rooted in local tradition. On the other hand, both dialects can converge towards the surrounding speech norms, that is, monolingual dialects of Uruguayan Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese, thus creating linguistic continuity across the border. So let's look at the distribu distribution of a couple of variables in each of the languages spoken in Rivera. Let's look at Portuguese first. Um, remember that Alicia's speech, uh, yeah and yeah, was, was variable, right? So uh, the first one we're going to look at is the, the, the vocalized version of the lateral um, that coexisted in, in her speech and in the speech of the community in general. So here is the quantification. Um, we see that the standard form, the lateral, uh, is preferred, it's, it's, it's very stylistically stratified, right? Formal style um, prefers the lateral, also socially stratified in terms of socioeconomic groups, the upper class is producing that more, uh, women and the young people. The lateral pronunciation is more frequent among these groups, um, and that resembles very much what we see in the distribution of this uh, variable in Brazil as well. Uh, the other variable is the palatalization of um, D, T, which I presented in the paper that Scott was talking about. Um, dia and Gia, Tia and Chia. Um, uh, it's, it's still an innovation in Uruguay and Portuguese, even though in Brazil it's, it's very generalized. Um, and the distribution is the following. So the very first social group is um, age, and the young people produce way more palatalized G and G than the, 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 the elderly. And then again, the upper middle class, as opposed to the working class, and women as opposed to men. So if we put together both variables, the lateral and the palatal, uh, we'll see that they are socially stratified both by socioeconomic groups and age going to the same direction and reflecting a distribution very similar to what has been encountered in Brazil uh, for both palatalization in a study by Pereira de Souza and the lateral pronunciation in studies um, by, for example, Moreira Ferreira, uh, Bortoni Ricardo, among others. Um, this indicates not a rupture, in my view, between these dialects, between Uruguay and Brazilian Portuguese, but sociolinguistic continuities, uh, and erases the idea of a geographic isoglose separating these, these dialects. And I wanted to add that the work of Pacheco now, she found a gente in Uruguay and Portuguese, and I hadn't seen that. And she found uh, quite a lot in subject positions only. So you see that it's entering there. But, uh, but it's there, so it's another isogloss that is 
being erased. Um, uh, so this is blue variation. Remember that's blue because we're going to need that. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's hear. Um, let's take a quick look at some sociolinguistic patterns in border Spanish now, based on interviews given by the same speakers. The, the ones that provided data for my Portuguese analysis. But first, let's uh, hear a short segment from Alicia's interview. Alicia, again, the, 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 the woman who gave us the first uh, sample of Ruben and Portuguese. So here she's speaking uh, Spanish. <laughs> So how do you think? <laughs> uh, there's no Uruguayan here in the audience. Is there? Anybody? Are you from Uruguay? Yes. Sí. Te sí. suena? Mi padre es de Trinidad. ¿De dónde? Trinidad Flores. Trinidad Flores. ¿Y eso te suena a qué? Me digo uruguayo. Uruguayo. <laughs> Pero fronterizo no. Fronterizo o no necesariamente. Uh, I don't. You don't. You were no. raised there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because Montevideans would recognize right away as a border, border Spanish. So let's um, here. Um, we have the edition of S. Um, um, S in the poet, but there isn't much to be talked about. And I'm not saying that this is a representative of Alisa's speech. In other parts of the interview, she probably uh, used code switching and words and stuff like this. And, but, but this part, I didn't see anything um, going on in terms of Portuguese presence. But again, that's not to say that she doesn't have any in her speech. Um, so now we're going to look at the quantification of two variables in Spanish. Uh, one is uh, as aspiration, which again we didn't hear here, but uh, but there is in her speech and in the community. And the other is verbal voseo, and she didn't talk to me in this segment, so she didn't have the chance to choose between a two form and a, and a voice form. So um, first, um, let's start with the syllable final as aspiration. Again, a linguistic innovation in the border dialect that originated in. Montevideo. So there's this nice quote here. Ellos allá dicen vos, nosotros vos. So the, the, the sibling is a, is a local marker, as opposed to what they say in the South. Um, so let's look at the quantification again. This is aspiration. Um, the application of aspiration that the race shows again, that the, the professors prefer the aspirated um, sound, which is different from what we see. Um, in the Spanish-speaking world, um, also the young people, and, and then the male here, not the, the female, and uh, but a little bit uh, stratified stylistically as well. Aspiration has entered interestingly through the speech of the upper classes and young people. Since aspiration was not detected in border Spanish before by other studies, um, it seems to be another case of dialect leveling with other aspirating dialects in Uruguay, thus creating linguistic continuity. We'll see the same tendency in the distribution of verbal voseo, our next variable. Um, and here we have a super token, right? We have the same person using um, two form and then voice form. Border orient, um, Sorry, border areas of northern Uruguay used to be classified as um, tuteantes. Rona called it uh, called the, the border zona de tuteo exclusivo. Nevertheless, currently voice forms have been incorporated in the second person verbal system and coexists with the two form in a variable manner. So let's see how it's um, socially distributed. 
Um, again, here we see the same pattern. Um, we see the young people using more of the new form, of the national form, less of the local too, and then the upper classes and the women. Once again, dialect leveling towards the national monolingual varieties is led by the young people and the upper classes. When we look at these two variables together, we see the same distribution of patterns, and this is green variation, right? Um, so we have more aspiration and more of a role sale according to age and social class. So we see um, that both aspiration and verbal role forms that were first considered to be typical of multivivale of monolingual speech have entered the border dialect and represent continuity with the South, just like the patterns we saw for Uruguay and Portuguese represent continuity with the North. So let's look at all these patterns together. So now we have green variation and blue variation, blue being Portuguese, green being Spanish, and we have the same thing as this again. The standard versus the non-standard, sometimes it's more a question of being local and non-local, national and the fronteries. Um, these patterns show that while local border varieties may diverge from national monolingual dialects, right? This diversion, no classes or people. Um, by keeping a more local focused variety of both Spanish and Portuguese, uh, they can also converge towards the surrounding monolingual standards. Uh, creating linguistic, again, continu continuity across the border. David Britton claims that there is a general tendency nowadays that majority variance in contact communities will level away all others. A tendency detected in several dialects of Spanish as well by Carol Clee in 2009, who after reviewing several cases of Spanish in contact with other languages, concludes, and I quote, that there is evidence that within the past 20 to 30 years, younger generations are increasingly adapting non-contact variants in place of regional features, end of quote. More specifically, Jim Mikno Mikno <laughs> help me out, you know Jim? Miknovitz, Scott? Miknovitz. A uh, study of Spanish in contact with Mayan in Yucatan, Mexico, finds that younger speakers are increasing their use of voiced fricatives, thus leading a change away from the local dialect towards standardization. As far as border communities are concerned, Carmen Yamas finds on the border of Scotland and England that her young participants tended to use more glottal stops in line with national trends, diverging from the local ways of speaking. Similar tendencies are reported on the border of Galicia and Portugal, where, according to Jane Fenswick, increased cross-border contact has resulted in dialect leveling between Galician and Portuguese. As a result, minority languages, instead of undergoing sociolectal reduction, reduction as reported to be the case of French Canadian by Monjoin and Vignac, may actually allow for the selective extinction to not only to constant exposure to the surrounding monolingual ideals, but also to ideological inclinations towards a more global and less local identity. Now, the tendencies that I show you today occur at the intralinguistic level, but I am now engaged in a project uh, where I wanted to look at interlinguistic phenomena. I wanted to look at the influence of Spanish on Portuguese and of Portuguese on Spanish. Uh, and I've started this uh, by looking at the expression of subject personal pronouns in both Portuguese and Spanish among the same bilinguals. So let's take a quick look at this one before we go have some wine and cheese. I meant to say cheese and wine. <laughs> uh, we, we know that in both Portuguese and Spanish, um, the subject pronoun expression is variable. We all know this, right? 
Então, se eu cozinho, eu como muito, se cozinho, eu como muito, se eu cozinho, eu como muito, se cozinho, eu como muito, etc. Uh, we also, a lot of us here know that in Brazilian Portuguese, there is a tendency towards the explicit, the explicit use of subject pronoun, which is different from European Portuguese. Um, so we see here this quantification, the European Portuguese, according to this study, 22% um, of overall rate, and as opposed to Brazilian Portuguese, 60% of overall rate. And some people are saying that uh, Portuguese is not a fruit drop language anymore. Brazilian Portuguese is not a fruit drop language anymore. So Spanish, on the other hand, continues to be seen as a fruit drop language, despite a lot of cross-dialectal variation, as we can see on table six. So we see that it may vary from a very strong tendency to no, <coughs> to nose, as seen in Madrid, to a tendency towards expressed uh, pronouns in the Caribbean varieties of Spanish, such as Puerto Rico, which is high compared to Madrid, but still much lower than what we saw for Brazilian Portuguese, which was 60%. Mm -hmm. So let's see what bilinguals do faced with the same variable, but two very different output, two very different tendencies. Do they keep these different behaviors or do they try to level them out in order to save cognitive space, which is Silva Corvalan's proposal? Any other artists trying to save cognitive space, this would be a great place to do it. Um, so in the Spanish interviews, I found, in the Spanish interviews, my child and I found um, 35%, and it's only a small, um, actually only a very small corpus of 12 interviews, 12 bilinguals first in Spanish, and then again, same people speak <laughs> Portuguese. We are extending the corpus now. So based on these 12 speakers, we found 35% for Uruguayan Portuguese Spanish and 59% for Uruguayan Portuguese. When we compare these frequency rates with the other dialects of both Spanish and Portuguese, we see that Uruguayan Portuguese is keeping up with Brazilian Portuguese behavior, and that um, Uruguayan Portuguese, I, I wish I had data from Uruguayan, Uruguayan Spanish, but I don't. So I'm comparing, you know, I have Argentinian Spanish and Chilean Spanish, and it's, it's right around here, it's even less than Chilean, you know, less than Argentinian. Um, it looks like that, in terms of overall frequencies, Uruguayan Portuguese has not converged uh, with border Spanish in the minds of these bilinguals, bringing further evidence, in my view, that languages are kept separate and alongside the monolingual varieties. My next step in this regard is to compare the effect of linguistic factors on the realization of this variable to see if there are differences in terms of constraint rankings as well. I uh, have some results, but we don't have time to go over them. Uh, it seems that the same variable for now um, behaves very differently in terms of, uh, of, of uh, ranking as well. But not very differently because they're universals, but, but somewhat differently. So let me conclude by saying that I hope to have shown evidence that Portuguese-speaking communities in Uruguay are bilingual and diglossic, and that both Spanish and Portuguese show continuity with monolingual surrounding national dialects in variable complex ways. Thus, instead of one monolingual, monoestalistic, and mixed <coughs> portuñol, these studies reveal a bilingual and multidialectal repertoire resembling repertoires found in other bilingual communities such as the Puerto Ricans in New York, Bayona Salesintea, or the um, uh, German-Hungarian bilinguals in Austria, Susan Gall, or uh, Carmen Fahl, her work on, on Chicano English in Los Angeles. Uh, thus, I believe that these results shed light on the contribution of variation studies and help us better understand uh, bilingual varieties in general and this particular context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, so we'll open it up. And you want to field your own questions or you want me to stop them for you? I, I, you can say.
sit down, I can do it. <laughs> Thank you. No, not not here. I just got the overall frequency here. But I do have results for that. And uh, it does show a little bit of, uh, it doesn't seem to be very socially stratified. It's more like linguistic. Okay. It's much more linguistic. But I saw a little bit, it would tell people I cannot talk about social factors. But I do have in the Spanish data a little bit of preference towards um, express pronouns among the working class to old people that I have in, in this, in an, uh, that has been analyzed. Yeah. yeah, which I believe that if we expand and uh, this tendency continues, it would be a question of substratum because these people um, do speak more Portuguese and Spanish, not in terms of competence, but in terms of socialization. So I, I could the, um, something that is age, social, and, and, uh, and language preference all together, and I'm not sure how I'm going to speak that as far. No. But in Portuguese, I have, I, there's no, no social factor that uh, was captured by that rule. So, so you had mentioned earlier um, the idea of uh, fluent fluency, <coughs> or was it just fluent fluency? I think it was fluent fluency. Yes, fluent fluency. And, um, and then, and then Kendra Douglas's uh, proposal, which was somewhat different. So can you just go back to that in terms of what this nice, very, it came together so nicely at the end, like a symphony, and, and how it is that that uh, relates back to those two proposals? Yeah. Um, the idea of an aqualectal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the thing with, uh, I think, because I find it, complicated to talk about acrolect and baselect and mesolect when I don't see it as a creole. Uh, but I do agree uh, with, with Kendra in terms of the presence of both standard languages working as standards and standardizing forces in that case acrolectal. I just won't call it acrolectal because I don't see it as a creole. I just only because I'm working with Par Paraguayan bilingualism, I've seen so much, especially in fluent disfluency, yeah. incredibly rapid speech uh, in a uh, really fairly degraded version of what I mean by people who have basically left aside, left alone their childhood Guarani in terms of any kind of academic development, have gone entirely towards Spanish. When they do speak Guarani, they can do it extremely rapidly but they have to engage uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, devices to be able yeah. to put that what I need together. And it also shows some uh, evidence of language attrition, since that is the variedad <coughs> desatendida of the two that they controlled, since their lives mostly are carried out in their professional sphere in Spanish. You raise so many important issues. I don't even know how to <laughs> Um, okay, so back to, 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 to this view. Uh, Kendra Douglas proposed a um, tri, tri parted um, model. Yeah, yes. Yeah, when there's um, um, standard Spanish, standard Portuguese, and Uruguayan uh, Portuguese being uh, the, the intellectual variety. And for example, the trabajar, the vocalized e, the vocalized e, yeah. is um, is uh, placed here, and the ya is placed in standard Portuguese, right? So what I think I don't think she's wrong, but what I'm, I'm trying to show is the continuity between this local ya and the ya, right? Uh, because there is e everywhere as well in Brazil. Now um, this corpus of eighty-eight people that I have, uh, that I collected in 1995, um, and the, the subsequent corpus that I've been collecting there, they are bilinguals. And we were talking about it before. I haven't measured their bilingualism. I'm not going to take them to a language lab. 
and I'm not going to give them human skeleton uh, judgment. Uh, but there are other ways to measure it, and I, I want to talk to you about it uh, later on. Uh, they are bilingual single gender. I mean, they, they speak both languages in their everyday lives. Uh, I had some people who I did not include because could not give me the interview in Portuguese. Um, and there were three people who did not want to give me the interview in Portuguese because they said they didn't speak and actually thought that they did. They were not other class women. Uh, but two, two of them people actually did not speak Portuguese and they lived there. So uh, they were not included. Everybody else use both languages in their everyday lives, and I know that because I lived there and I, I hang out with these people. So it's not an attrition, uh, at least in my corpus, there's not cases where any Spanish, either Spanish or Portuguese have been attributed. Um, I'm gonna say something else, but I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Um, can we go back to your slide where you've got the four variables, your green and your purple variables? Green and yeah, I, yeah. I want it to be blue, but I think the Mac and no. yeah. it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so is this the green variable because you're talking about the Spanish language and the It's like 0.91, right? These are weights. Um, is the uh, people are leading and bringing the, the change in. Now, what's interesting is that this uh, variance, the prestigious variance in Portuguese, um, in Iran Portuguese, are also prestigious in Brazilian Portuguese, right? The Y and the G. The D is not stigmatized, but you know, G is urban. G is Carioca. G is school. Um, but E is very stigmatized. Very stigmatized. Okay. In terms of Spanish, though, you see that these two, as you're saying, regional uh, variation. Boseo is not prestigious. Aspiration is not prestigious in general. It is in Rivera because it resembles the way monolinguists speak, people from Montevideo. So there is a reverse here of social value, same variant, different social variable because of the social context. And I think that's pretty important. Mm. I mean, with the, the GG, is, is that like where it's a Well, 
upper class individual, but they are speaking Portuguese. Uh, is there Spanish? I don't know if this Spanish is particular in any way, but um, could you trace like overt ways, uh, overt features that are completely Portuguese and not part of the reverse, if you should say? Is it on the Spanish? Uh -huh.
that is the same thing. So I guess my question is more out of curiosity, and I, I have no clue even myself, but it's like, why would they t uh, tugs go towards this Spanish marker in both species? And I don't know. Spanish markers are used all the time in Uruguay and Portuguese. Pero y bueno is used all the time. You don't see the same thing in, in, in Spanish, Portuguese marker markers being used in Spanish, just because we know that the majority language is the lexifier most of the time, and this is the same. I mean, Portuguese yeah, incorporates much, many more lexical items in Spanish than the reverse, just like Spanish speakers in the US have more English words in their Spanish than they have um, Spanish words in their English, right? So it's just a, it's an imbalance of, of, of power. Well, but, I think some that no S is also used all the time, right? No yeah. S. Uh, yeah, yeah, in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. No S is very, very humanizing.
issue of the subject pronoun expression, I was curious if in the local variety of Portuguese, if, um, for example, you get, I don't know if you want to call it non-agreement, but like uh, between tu and uh, like the verb, like do you get tu gosto or do you get tu gostas? Tu gosto, gosto. In, in organic Portuguese. I think that probably relates to why you get a, a, the uptick in the subject expression a little way. Oh, you're talking about like a conversation, like a functional explanation to it? Yeah. 